Okay, welcome to USQ Salon. I'm Geoffrey Saw from Management and Enterprise, and it's my pleasure to facilitate today. Welcome to the studio audience, and welcome also to people who are online. Firstly, acknowledgement of country in the spirit of reconciliation. The University of Southern Queensland recognises that it's situated on country for which the Jagera, Yugara and Yurupal people have been custodians for many centuries and on which they've performed age-old centuries, ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal. We acknowledge their living culture and unique role in the life of this region and offer our deep appreciation for their contribution to and support of our academic enterprise. Firstly, um, housekeeping, mobile phones, if you wouldn't mind putting them on silent if they're not already. Uh, here in the studio we have one exit, so in the unlikely event, uh, please exit calmly as directed. So today um, we'll have questions following the presentation and they, for people who are online, they can be emailed, as you see, to usqsalon at usq.edu.au and uh, Twitter and the Twitter links are there. Um, for our participants online, there's a link there for live, live stream chat uh, where you can tweet, as I mentioned. Uh, this salon is recorded and will be available for viewing later on. So let me introduce and welcome to USQ, Matthew Pesamenti. Matthew is the f founder and CEO of Conversion Kings. And Matthew is going to talk to us about something we're all aware of, but we're not aware that we're aware of because it's things that happen to us or impact us when we uh, in interact with websites, which of course we do many times during the day. So Matthew is going to tell us about uh, conversion rate optimization, the science of that, and introduce us to something that at least I wasn't aware of until very recently. So thank you, Matthew, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Jeffrey. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, we're all here to talk about conversion rate optimization. And uh, it was really interesting. Everyone asked me, like, what do you do? And I was like, oh, I do conversion rate optimization. And it's always proceeded with the next question, which is, what is that? Um, and obviously, I go through and explain it. So, oh, you know, obviously, we increase your 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 customers who land on the website and turn them into uh, prospects into customers, which is then proceeded with the next question is, how do you do that? And today, what I really want to share with yourselves is basically what conversion optimization is and how do we turn people who have landed on your website into customers, whether or not they're a paying customer buying something from your site or they're generally coming through and generating a, uh, a lead or a lead generation as well. So without further ado, I'm going to run, run into the presentation. Uh, let's have a look here. All right. Lovely present um, preparation that I had <laughs> getting up here in here. So just firstly, um, as I kick off, I'd like to share with everyone a little bit about um, the, the company that, uh, that I founded. It's called Conversion Kings, and basically it's all around conversion optimization. And the reason why I thought to start with this is I just want to impress upon you why I basically have the right to be standing here talking to you about what conversion optimization is and how to do it. So from a high level perspective, conversion optimization is about running A-B tests. And within the, the short three years, I've run between two and a half to 3,000 tests, which gives me a wealth of knowledge and experience of actually what works, but also what doesn't work. So of all the successes we've had in testing, I've had a lot of failures and that's where all the learning actually comes from. Um, we use a piece of software called Optimizely. It's a bit of a flagship op, um, software in the CRO space and we're really proud to say we were the very first three-star partner with this software provider. Um, and if any, anyone's wondering, it is actually three out of three stars. So if you're going, where's those other two stars that you guys didn't get? Um, they were never there to begin with. Um, clicking through. Uh, we're ranked within the top 10 optimized agencies internationally, which is a great kudos to, to ourselves and what we've done. And in 2016, we ran a test which had the highest revenue uplift ever used by anyone using the Optimizely software. Again, really proud of that. Um, and that only come, came from a lot of learning and a lot of failures to get to that point. 
and clicking through on my amazing PowerPoint that's very responsive. Um, we've got a team of 20 people running this um, and we're all certified in all the major A-B testing tools. And as we click through, wow, this is going really well. Sorry guys, I feel like I should be dancing while we're clicking. Uh, nearly there. Ah, here we go. So to give you an idea, so who are the top clients that we normally work with? Um, you can see some of the brands up there of the, the businesses that we work with. And over in 2016, we added an extra $100 million to their, their bottom line, which is fantastic, which means they haven't spent any more money on marketing, but we've made them more revenue. It's pretty cool. Um, a lot of the businesses up there you'll see have one thing in common. They generally have a lot of traffic, and that's one of the key elements to conversion optimization. But it's not the only one, and we do have strategies to help people who don't have that much traffic as well. So what is CRO? So CRO is fundamentally creating a better user experience to get a user to the goal that you're trying to achieve. That goal could be someone signing up to a newsletter. It could be someone purchasing something or even sending through an inquiry. I love this example here. Um, this is a Barack Obama and it was a matter of they were trying to get more people to land on this site, put in their details for the chance to actually win a dinner with Barack. Fantastic, right? The question is, how do we get more people that land on that page to give us their details? It's quite hard. And they tried with different types of creative. So you can see on the left-hand side where you've got a beautiful picture of Barack, and on the right-hand side, you've got a picture of him sitting around a table with everybody. Interesting, just changing that image there had an increase of 19%. So 19% more people that landed on that page filled in their details as a result to that different image. Pretty powerful, right? So a lot of the questions are, what are the types of tests that we can run? This sounds all well and good, this is awesome. So are there different, what are the types of tests? So in CRO, to make it really nice and clear and give you guys the, the tools that whenever you're talking to someone about CRO, you can have the right education to make the right decisions, is there's different types. So you've got an A-B test, which is basically we've got the control and we're challenging it with another variation. So we're saying, does this work better than this? And you may hear the concept of an ABC test. And that's basically the control, which is the normal state, versus one, two, three, four, five different variations. Multivariant test. This is another type of test, and people get very excited about this, and, and rightfully so. It's where you change a number of different elements on the page, and you see what combination of those different elements will have a better conversion rate. So think about when you go, you're getting dressed in the morning. Does this tie work best with this jacket to make myself look good? Um, and you try and find different um, uh, combinations. The next one is server-side testing. This is the next iteration to testing, and it's one of the ones where it's a little bit technical, so hang on to your seats a little bit here. But basically, we plug the, application, the testing platform into the application. What that enables us to do, and this is a game changer for a lot of people in retail, is it enables us to do pricing tests. So from a retail perspective, if you charge an extra $2 for your product, will that have a negative downturn in your conversion rate or will it stay the same? If it stays the same, you've just made more money because you've just increased your profitability. Or what happens if I drop my price by $2? Will my conversion rate instantly increase? And actually, when you look at it from the profitability point of view, you're actually um, making more money. And the other one there is personalization. And we may have heard about, per about personalization in the past, it's a bit of a buzzword. Personalization is really cool. Basically, it's about taking what are the unique attributes to that user and how do I serve up an, an experience which is completely relevant to that person. So in this example, you can see um, temperature. So if someone logs onto your website in say Northern Queensland and you're selling uh, apparel and it's really hot, the last thing I wanna do is show them jumpers. We wanna show them t-shirts and shorts. But what about the temperature of someone in Melbourne? They log on, log on to that website and that's not relevant. So we can personalize it so we can show them jumpers and socks and, and nice boots. So here's some examples of what we've done in the past. Um, for it. Yep. So this is a single page um, test that we ran for OPSM. And you can see there that the hypothesis around this was people have landed on the website, 
I need to book an eye test. I can't see that well. And I can't really see the item for, for book an eye test. So let's make that more prominent. Will that increase people clicking through? Hot tip, it didn't. So, <laughs> and the concept of why it didn't was this concept of banner blindness. So what happens is now we all go onto the internet and everyone's trying to sell us everything and you have these banners and when you look at the eye tracking of people when they're on a site they see a banner and they actually look away from it so that's actually detracting people even though we think we're attracting them we're actually pushing them away there's actually a reduction in people clicking through the other types of tests we've got is a multi-page test this here is where we're working with a fashion retailer and the really interesting part about that is where their market was women now, women shop differently to guys. Like us guys, we're pretty simple, right? You tell us to go here, do that, click that, buy that, we're done. Women, they shop differently. They actually shop, they love to browse, they need love to look around. Don't get in their way, get out of their way. Just show them the product. So we can see here in this example, on the left-hand side on the control, um, you've got the facet navigation on the left, which is reducing the space on the screen where we can show more product. So we got rid of that on the variation. On the product display page, opposed to having a small image on the left and then the content, the e-commerce on the right, we said, let's make the product the focus. Let's get the user straight onto that product. Um, so we change that in the variation. So you can see you've got the control and then you've got the variation. Then we've got a multivariate test. So let's jump back to OPSM. So here we're trying to get more people to book an eye test. That's their current page. The hypothesis around here was that a lot of people go from Google to the, OPS, the, the book an eye test page. It's missing all the branding and the value to the actual brand of OPSM. So we designed a number of different experiences which came together and looked exactly like this. Now I thought they would see this and it would be amazing. They'd put a plaque of my face on the foyer of OPSM when you walk in because they'd be like, wow, that's just so cool. It completely tanked. Um, it reduced the bookings by 32%. So what we can see here is that although testing is great, which it is, beauty doesn't always mean conversions. So um, the value to testing isn't just about how we can increase conversions, but it's also how can we can protect a change that's not going to have a negative impact. Jumping onto server-side testing, this is where we plug the A-B testing into your uh, application. And these are all the businesses that are doing server-side testing. So you can see there's some pretty well-known brands there. So wh what and how do they do it? Probably not the best, uh, when it clicks over, not the best example for a presentation, too much text in there. But what we're able to do is start testing the different algorithms that basically Google are using to s for their search results. When people are looking for a piece of accommodation, what type of results are going to come back? So we can actually get in there and change the way that whole system works through testing and see which one works better than the other. And then as we get onto the personalization, um, a great example we mentioned before is about weather. So we've got technology that can identify the location of the user and the temperature that they're experiencing at that point in time. So when they log onto the website, the website will change to make sure it serves relevant product to that individual. So if I'm in Toowoomba and it's freezing cold in the morning, I'm going to get a very different type of product set than if I'm sitting in the Gold Coast, Burley Heads Beach uh, in the nice sun, I'll be getting different product as well. So that's where we look at more of a one-to-one -one relationship. You can test everything and anything. And uh, I've got a quick uh, slide up there where there's over 72 different testing options. Is it all the options? Definitely not, there's hundreds of them, but at least it's a good starting point for anyone wanting to do testing to have a look and get some inspiration of, oh, maybe I can test this on my website. So what's the benefits to CRO? So obviously um, testing is a great way to validate whether or not a change should happen or find an opportunity, but what are some other benefits to it? So I've put together a uh, very simple slide deck. So the first one is, Let's make better marketing decisions. So you can see in my OPSM example where I thought I was going to be like the next big thing um, and I wasn't. Um, so we can make better marketing decisions not based on the I reckon methodology or the hippo methodology as, as in the highest paid person's opinion, but we can base it on data. So we can make better marketing decisions. Um, 
less arguments. Now, if anyone here works in an IT uh, environment or a business where everyone's struggling for uh, resources or their opinion, it can get a little bit heated around those boardrooms. Like, I think this should definitely be the best way to go. I don't know, I think this is better, the better way. The cool thing about optimization, or CRO I should say, is that it basically says, this is exactly what your users are doing. It doesn't matter what you think, what I think, it just matters what the, con the consumer does. So it ha gets rid of all the arguments. The other part to it as well, is a better use of IT and design resources. IT will always be an overused resource within a business because everyone needs IT. So how do you get your requirement for IT to get to the top of the, the dev sprint? Or how do you get the IT guys to actually dev out what you need? Is going to them with a strong business case. We've tested this change on the website. We can clearly see it's gonna make us an extra 30% additional revenue, bring in another 20% more leads. If we make this change, please make this change now. And you'll see that everyone changes how they prioritize things when you can put a financial or business outcome to the work that they're actually doing. The other part to why conversion optimization is so cool is that the rise, the, the cost of traffic is rising. If anyone here has done PPC or paid advertisement before, you know, as you go back a few years, you could buy clicks for under a dollar. Um, now, personally, in our own agency, we spend between 12 to $15 for just one click. So we've got to make the most of those clicks. Um, and that's obviously rising and going up and up as there's more competition coming into the, uh, the funnel. It's not a surprise, well, it's no secret, that customers are also less lo loyal. So gone are the days when people have an affiliation to a brand. Not saying there is no more affiliation, but it's less likely these days. So if we don't convert them on the time when they land on the website, they're going to go over to one of your competitors and they're going to purchase. From a university perspective, if someone lands in on your, your site, if they don't send through an inquiry, they're going to find another university to send their inquiry, go into their sales funnel, and then you miss that opportunity. So it's a matter of we need to convert those people when they, um, they happen. And the other part to it is, if you're not doing optimization, if you're not always looking how you can make your experience better for your user, guess what? The competitors are. So the longer you wait to actually think about how can I make this better for my user, test, iterate and implement, the longer, the further the distance between you and your competitors are, competitors are going to be. Now the other part to conversion optimization, this is the part I really like, the amount of cash you can make as a result. And maybe it's my European background that just uh, cash is king, but it all comes down to, in this example, we can look at a particular um, business. Monthly average users of 100,000. So 100,000 people come to the website. It's an e-commerce business. And they have an average order value of $80, which means on average, someone's gonna spend about $80 uh, when they purchase. And they've got a conversion rate of 2%. So 2% of the 100,000 people are spending $80 which gives them a monthly revenue of $160,000 a month. Multiply that by 12, we've got a yearly revenue just under 2 million, 1.9. Now, what happens if we don't change the number of people coming to the website, still 100,000, let's just itch the order, uh, average order value up by $2. Let's just have a few more cross sales, a little bit, a bit more upsell. Let's try and merchandise our product a little bit more effectively. Let's increase the conversion rate. And now look, we're not turning anything on fire here. We're only just moving up 20%. We're going from two to 2.4%, small change. So our monthly revenue rises from 160,000 to 196,000, which on an annual, when you look at it from an annual perspective, that's an extra $440,000. 400, 440 grand, you could probably buy a small apartment down on the Gold Coast. You could buy yourself a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. Um, but the cool thing about it is that you haven't spent any more money on marketing. You've just found out what's a better way that I can help customers purchase my product. So CRO is a really interesting space. Go back uh, three years ago when we started the agency, there was very little people actually doing CRO. So we were kind of like the only one out there doing it. Now there's a lot of businesses and agencies that are doing CRO and unfortunately, Sometimes people see the opportunity without really understanding the fundamentals behind it. And I'm not sure if you've ever experienced that in your previous uh, professional life. 
So what we've got is really five guiding principles on how to run a CRO program. And if you follow these five, you should be fairly confident that the outcome that you get should be successful. So what are they? Uh, first one is velocity. So what velocity relates to is the number of tests that we run. On average, about 40% of tests that you run will be successful, meaning 40% of the time you're going to be high-fiving yourself, pouring Gatorade, running around the office, letting everyone know you're such a rock star, how much money you've made them. Which means 60% of the time, tests will either be negative or inconclusive, saying that you've got more opportunity to do your business harm than you do good. So how do you turn that around? How do you stack the odds in your favour? And simply, it's about running more tests. So if you run one test a month, you've got more chance of actually going backwards than you do forwards. You run two, three, four, five tests a month, you then have more opportunity to find a winner, to find what your customers are sensitive to in a positive light to iterate on again as well. So number one is velocity. Find a way, how can we run a higher volume of tests? The other part to running a success, successful testing program that's not spoken about much, but because we're amongst friends here, and obviously in the internet, let us, let us um, table it now. Let's, let's bring the elephant out of the room. This is a new tactic. This is something which is changing the way that people generally do development and optimise that, or uh, improvements to their website. It's basically before we go all excited, gung-ho and push it into production, let's test it first and validate it. Now, that is a change, not just from the way you work, but sometimes the way the whole company will work. And if your project sponsors within the business are like, what is this testing business? I know what's, what's right. I was talking to my wife's friend's little kid who uses an iPhone and he reckons this is a good idea, so that's what we should be doing. You're going to have problems. So what we really need in CRO is also getting everyone on the concept is that test before you invest. Look at the data, not just the opinion. So if we can get everyone on board, you're going to have a much better opportunity to really support this program. The next one there is quality. And I love this one because uh, a lot of people run their testing program based on the I reckon methodology, which is valid, I guess, sometimes, um, where people go, you know, I reckon we should test this or I reckon we should change something on our homepage. The thing is that it's the data which is the most important part here. Um, a lot of people, so from an e-commerce perspective, go, look, we really need to, our homepage really isn't effective. The reality is most people um, that make a sale from a website don't even enter the website from the homepage. They enter from a category page or a product display page. They don't even see the homepage. So people over here using the I reckon methodology are wasting all their time changing all the homepage. Little, little do they know, the people who actually convert don't even see it. They're actually somewhere else. So you're wasting your time. So the key point here is actually running quality tests based on data, not on the I reckon methodology. This next part here is what pretty much everyone gets wrong. Um, and it's agility, which means that once you've got a winning test, you've found that this change has increased conversions through the testing where we're running it, is you need to get that into production or the live site ASAP. You've got to get that really quickly because that's when you get the true uplift in the program. So if you find that actually changing the elements or changing the copy or the words or anything, get that into production uh, really quickly. Which leads on to the final and last uh, um, guiding principle of how to get incredible lift with your CRO program. All this is useless if you don't follow this one thing. So if you take away anything from today, this is the one point and I'm building it up a fair bit, so it's got to be good, right? So um, the way I like to describe it when it goes through is golf. So I'm not sure if anyone here plays golf. Um, you do? Excellent. Um, so conversion optimization is a little bit like golf. You're starting off from the tee where you hit the ball. And let's say your conversion rate is currently 1%. And you want to go to where uh, the, the, the flag is. And that might be at 3%. So the question is, how do I get from 1% to 3%? How do I go from the ball to the hole? So I was out on the golf course the other day and I took a photo of um, Jeffrey as he was playing um, golf. And it will come through hopefully soon. 
and there he is. And we mapped his shots. And we can see when he hit a few balls, <laughs> some went in the trees, some went in the water, in the sand. And if you think about the variations of the tests that we run, as we mentioned before, only 40% are going to be successful, which means 70% are going to go off the, the course. We can see that not every single one of them is going to be successful, but some are. And we can note here at the very top there, the ones that actually did the best, we go, okay, that variation had the highest improvement to that conversion rate. Great, excellent learning. The wrong thing to do here is to go, okay, so I went from 1% to 1.2%. Okay, so to get to 3%, maybe I just need a bigger club. Maybe I need a different ball. Maybe I need a different player of golf. It's actually not the way it is. The way we do it is that when we tee off that first time, we can see that test has taught us something. It's told us that our users are really positively responding to this change. So let's implement that. Then we go, okay, now we know that, how can we make that even better? So then we basically do another round of variations on the back of what we just learned and we roll it again, so another round. So you can see you've got testing round one, testing round two, and we're coming up here to testing round three. And this way where we're testing, we're implementing, we're learning, we're testing, implementing, learning. And you can see there's a cycle here. So if you follow this as a concept of how you're going to continually find improvement, how you're going to continually learn and iterate, this is actually how you get to your goal of that 3%. It's not by, let's change the color of a button, it's gonna be a silver bullet test and it's gonna, we can all make millions of dollars. It's a matter of understanding what is relevant to your customers, testing a change, learning from it, iterating again. So now that I've given you all a crash course on conversion optimization, we're now gonna have a little bit of, a, uh, bit of fun with it. I wanna see which one of you is actually the smartest marketer of all. No pressure. So um, here's an example of a, of a true A-B test. So you've got a page on the left-hand side on the control where it's, you're wanting people to go on there and download and use a coupon. And the hypothesis was, we think people are worried that they may lose their data, so we want to put some security badges on there as well. So you can put, see you've got the security badge on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we're running it with no security badge. Who here thinks that the control with the security badge increased conversion rates? Yep, we've got a few in the room. And variation one without the, the security badge. Okay. The result is the one without security badge. Yeah, would you like to share why you, you thought that was? Correct, yeah, excellent, well done, that's great. I couldn't have said it better myself, that's exactly right. Um, yeah, so you've, you've increased the level of anxiety and then you've you know, reiterated it with the, that bodgy looking security badge. All right, here's another one. Selling watches online. Now, the presentation of this is a little bit rubbish, so I'm gonna have to walk you through it because it didn't look so good when I put in the presentation. So here, selling watches online, on the left-hand side on the control, you've got never been beaten on price. On the right-hand side, that little blue icon is authorised reseller. So the question is, what would increase conversions? Never be beaten on price or authorised reseller? Who thought variation one, authorised reseller? We've got two, three. Who thought never be beaten on price? pretty much everyone else. The answer is authorised reseller. I love this example because it's about what is stopping the customer from making the purchase. So buying watches online, the biggest anxiety people have is, is it real? Because they all look fantastic. Anyone can take a photo, put it on the internet and go, hey, yes, this is a real Rolex. Um, I fell into that trap when I was over in uh, um, Kuala Lumpur. And this gentleman said, it's a, it's, it's a real fake. And I'm like, hey, awesome. Um, it only lasted till I walked out of the shop. Um, so you can see there, 107% increase. So we're also understanding here, it's a small change. 
massive increase in sales, double, over double the sales of the watch by lowering the people's anxiety of why they're not purchasing. So the next one here is another cool test and I like it because I've just told you the answer because I clicked too fast. <laughs> so let me, <laughs> let me explain what happened here. Um, so we've got a variation on the left where we're getting people to land on this page, give us their details, and then we'll let them watch the video. Or the other option is we reduce the friction. So we said, hey, don't read anything, just give us your details and you can watch the video. Now, mostly people of generally my um, generation would go, you know what, I love the one, the clean design, give you my details, press submit, give me the video, because I don't want to read anything. The challenges with this is that the actual market is older people. And they were like, you know what, I don't really think I want to give you my details. Who are you to, for me to give you my details? Um, so actually having information about who it is, why I want the details and a picture of them, obviously um, was a positive way of doing it. So this is where the design, the beauty, didn't really, um, wasn't as successful as the other variation. Without clicking and giving it away, here we go. So here we're, we're um, this is uh, Suzuki over in the, the UK. And what they're wanting to know is what homepage banner or set of type of banner was most effective in getting people to send through an inquiry. Was it the one where you've got the two images or the one where you've got the lifestyle image on, on the right? So you might be internally thinking yourself and I'm not gonna sort of keep putting everyone under the microscope here. But if you think about yourself, just Think which one you'd choose and let us show you which it is. Okay, now the click doesn't want to show me. All right, one more click. There we go, cool. So the uh, variation A. So this over here, you might be going, why? It doesn't look as exciting as a the racy yellow car. But you also need to understand that this is general traffic coming to the homepage. Not everyone likes the, the, the racing car. I myself, who've just had a uh, child, I'm more thinking about how can I get my child and my dog and my wife into a car nice and easy, because that's, so they, the variation A is more relevant. So the other concept to this here is about self-segmentation. So we've got general traffic coming to one location and we wanna give the ability to say, hey, what's relevant for you? You choose, you tell me what's relevant. Is it this one or this one? If you go to a lot of uh, fashion sites at the moment, you'll notice that that big, beautiful lifestyle image has now been replaced with, where do you wanna go, men or women? So it's about how can I self-segment the user into the right area? Um, the final one we're gonna go through today is uh, stun guns. So I'm not sure if anyone here, because in Australia they're illegal, right? So no one should have one. But here we've got an example where we're selling a stun gun for $500, 500 USD. So on the left, we've got the, the stun gun, 500 USD. And on the right hand side of the page, you've also got a cheap version of the stun gun and that's $200. So on the other variation, variation B, that right hand column, the distraction has been removed to just show that stun gun. The question is which one increased the conversion of that $500 the yellow stun gun? Was it the one where we had the side panel with the cross cell or was it one without it? Big question, right? So when you're trying to set up your, your e-commerce site, that's a, that's a relevant one to ask yourself is do we cross sell, do we not cross sell? How can it benefit, how could it not? So the one with the cross sell actually improved now, before we all go run out and go, okay, let's put cross sales on all our product display pages, we need to understand why did it work? So the reason it worked was because of a phenomenon called sticker shock. And that's where we use a low price product alongside a high price product to add additional value to the high price product. So let's think about how someone would use a stun gun. So you use a stun gun generally to save your life. It's not to have fun with your mates because these things actually really hurt, right? So people think about what is my life worth? Am I worth the $200 bargain basement stun gun 
or you know what, I'm actually worth protecting, so give me the, the good one. Because when anyone comes near me, I want to make sure they're, they're really stunned. So we can see by using a lower price product gives additional value to a higher price product and then enables a conversion. The other thing it enables us to do is it, it minimizes people going off the site to compare. So if you have a comparison on the site, we can actually stop people going, get your, your, your product description, throwing it into another tab and then try and finding someone else who sells it cheaper. So I'm going to flick through these other, other examples because um, although I get a little bit excited about it, sometimes people get a little bit um, bored. So what I wanted to jump to though um, is a social experiment on conversion optimization. So we all think, okay, this is all well and cool. You know, Matt's all great. Technology, websites, that's how you do CRO. But you know what? It's actually a lot deeper than that. And we actually do CRO every single day without even realizing it. What are we trying to do to get a better results? Why we dress the way we do is why we choose the mate we have. And this is a really cool social experiment. I'm going to show you a little snippet of it um, so you can understand exactly other ways that you can present it. Now, hopefully there's audio, which I didn't check. Well, don't think about it. Nope. Just do it. Do it. Um, Thumbs are on track. It not is sure if you are amazing. too, guys, but I can... Uh, I can talk through if, if not. Oh, here we go. So basically they've got identical twins They've put them in a controlled environment and they've made just one small change. They haven't done anything else other than just one little bit and which is chewing a piece of gum. So what they wanted to test is if people are chewing a gum, does that change the perception of that person? And the results are, are quite outstanding. We're probably going to go buy more chewing gum now, but... Um... Which one has more imaginary friends? It's an interesting thing here. It's only chewing gum, right? But now you're Which making one gets invited to more differences parties? to that person as a small change. Which one gets invited to more bridge tournaments? Which one is the bad cop? Which of these bosses would give you a raise? So again, thinking about a website, it doesn't need to be a big wholesale change to make a Which difference. One would fire you when you ask for it can a only raise. be a small difference and still make a big change. So yeah, this is a bit of a fun experiment. Which one has a better sex life? Oh, okay, that's a bit much for a university. All right, so, all right. So as you can see there, it's a great way you can, you can find that just by making a small adjustment, people can change their opinion of, of yourself or people around you. We can do the same for a website. Similarly to the way you might look at me and go, who is this guy with these crazy loud shirts, right? So we've actually tested to see there are people remembering me whether on the different types of clothes that I wear. So it's very easy at the end of the networking event for us to call people and go, hey, do you remember that guy wearing that really crazy looking shirt? Um, so we've tested to figure that out. We also test, even though we, we introduced ourselves to people, to see what actually has a more lasting impact on other people as well. So even if you think you take it down to that level, you can take it all the way up to the website as well. So I thought what might be fun is that if we have a website that anyone would like to, to talk about, or we can even do the USQ website, and we can do a walkthrough from a conversion perspective to see exactly how a conversion specialist such as myself would view an experience and table some questions on areas of improvement to that particular site. Um, so Jeffrey, do we have a, uh, a site that you would like us to, to have a look at or is there anyone in the, the auditorium that would, yes? Sorry, sorry, the website? Yes. When I've got my website up, I'd love you to have a look at it and tell me so my group gets into it. <laughs> yeah, excellent, happy to do so. I'm gonna jump on in, um, into the URL. So, 
good little bit of um, promo for yourself as well, which is great. So, um, so M. Oh, what? Oh, yeah, All right. Oh, I think I. Oh, no, hang on. No, no, no. That, that's my mistake. Yep. That's not yours, me. Was it? Yeah, the. Um, the keyboard's a little bit slow oh, to the okay. connection, so okay. I'm doing stuff up here and it's changing. Um, did you want me to want to jump up and type it? Yeah. That might be the best way. I can hold that for you if you like. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you typed it for me. Oh, you said I. Yep. Oh, there you go. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you lovely. Oh, the lovely photo of yourself there as well. That's great. <laughs> excellent. So before we even look at the site, what type of people are you attracting to the site? So the target audience is, um, oh, thank you. The target audience has been identified as women probably over um, the age of 25. And the books that I've sold definitely have majority been women who are interested in romance, history, because it's non-fiction, but I also do have a small um, market of, of men who enjoy those kind of stories as well. Yeah, great. And how are they finding your website? Are they coming through paid search, organic search, your email database? Uh, not my email database, because I don't have a very big, I mean, I only published it six months ago now, so. Okay, yep. <laughs> um, so it's more about, um, I'm not too certain how they are coming to this. So it has been about advertising it through um, ABC Radio, um, um, going out to audiences, um, and I've got it on Amazon, so people are coming through Amazon as well. Okay. Those kind of things. So let's take the hard one. Let's take the offline to online scenario, because that's generally the hardest one, because um, how do you connect the two? Mm. So if you've been on the radio, you've been talking about your book on the radio, people are going to pick up on a few things, either the key terms of the book, the title, or they're going to pick up on the name of the domain name to go to the website. So let's assume that people are actually going to the website from the domain name and they land on the homepage. So let's say people are landing on the homepage here. So the first thing I want to know is, am I in the right spot for the book? So what's the name of the book? Goodbye to Italia. Okay. Ah, okay, it's in there as well. So from my perspective, and when you look at it from every single day, it's very easy for you to say, oh, it's there, can't you see it? But my eye isn't attracted to the title. My eye is actually attracted to your image down the bottom left. Now the challenge is with the human eye, we've only can view, um, we can only focus on the diameter of a 50 cent piece. So if I'm over here looking at your, your, your picture over here, I can't even visualize or even see goodbye from Italia. So instantly I feel maybe I'm in the wrong spot here. Is this where I need to go? And this is what's gonna increase what's called your bounce rate. People getting to the website, oh, this isn't where I need to be, and bouncing off and removing. The other thing to think about, if they're on a radio, chances are they're probably in a mobile device. So let's have a look and change it to mobile. And six. So that's what people see when they land on a mobile device. And you've got to be thinking to yourself, are more people coming to my website on a mobile? And if they are, you'll generally find your conversion rate on a mobile is different to desktop. Okay. You look in your analytics and you're like, oh, wow. It's like half, a third. Maybe the reason could be about the experience on the mobile device is not as nice as a desktop device. The next part here is, okay, what do you want me to do? Okay, so I'm trying to find this book because I heard about it on the radio. Let's, let's go and try and find out about it. So I've got a video there. So 
I'm on my mobile. I don't really want to watch the video because it's not what I like to do. But some people may, but personally, I'm not really wanting to watch the video because um, I want to read because I'm a reader, right? That's what I do. Um, so Marissa Parker is in the middle of doing Okay, so I'm not quite sure if you're talking about this here as a book or if this here is yourself as the author. So out of curiosity, what, what actually is that? Is that your bio or is it the bio? It's of the bio of my mum and dad. Right. The story of my mum and dad during World War II. Oh, and that's what the book's about? Yes. Okay. So do you think if we've maybe had a bit of a heading or an intro into that manuscript, that would maybe give people a little bit more context to what that's all about? Okay. The other part to what we want to do is selling the book, obviously you need to get people engaged with it. They really need to love the different characters to it. So yes, you may have positioned them very well on the radio, hence why they've gone here to do a little bit more research, but maybe we need to, to remind them of exactly why they went there in the first place. So who are the main characters and why we should fall in love and why should we read them, uh, read about them. So we've got Goodbye to Italia. Um, One of the things we want to add in here is what are the additional value that we can have to it? So obviously we've got the book there. Um, my questions are, how many pages are in this book? Like, is it a short read? Is it a long read? Is it something I can read over a long period of time or I'm going to get through it in one night? The other part to it, we're asking them to buy now. It's a little bit like going into a shop and saying, walking in and having a look at something and the sales assistant coming up and going, oh, can I help you? Mm. So, oh, no, 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 you can't at all. I'm fine. Thank you very much. And off you go. So we want to be able to give them a little bit more information. Let's get them engaged before we say, hey, buy now. And a lot of the times people say, let you put that big buy now button up there so it's nice and clear. We want to educate them, get them engaged. And then when it's right, we ask them to buy. So here it could be instead of buy now, let's look at, say, more information. Read the first, let, read the contents page. Let's read the first chapter. Let's get them engaged and wanting it. So then instead of you having to push them to buy now, they're running to you saying, hey, give it to me. And it's a different balance of power. So let's have a look at the buy now process. So just say I'm like, yep, yeah, no, nah, I'm buying this. This is it for me. Um, let's buy now. Let's go through that process. Purchase options. All right. Um, so I'm just going to read it. Um, to celebrate Easter, Pasqua, Pasqua, um, a very holy feat for Italians, a feast for Italians. Goodbye to Italia, Italia, Italia. Okay. Oh, sorry. Why did you discount it? Okay, sorry. So discounted it because to try and encourage some sales. Yeah. Okay. For, and then I advertised it through various, um, through the Dante Alighieri, through various places. And did you see an, a rise in the conversion rate as a result? No. Okay. Because I guess it's about value. If I want to immerse myself in this book and I want to go on this journey, $10 doesn't really make that much difference whether or not I want it because there's time associated and my time's worth more than ten dollars it's about do I really want to get involved with it but you've already discounted your product you've already made the value lower than what it actually is so now I'm thinking well maybe it's not as good as it is so you originally you were asking for twenty four dollars and now you're asking for fourteen without any sort of recommend re reason but if you're like look we're doing a special this month because of X, Y, Z, and it could be because we want to support, this was the month that my parents actually came to Australia and that's the reason why. Ah, oh, I, I get that, that makes sense to me and I'm incentivized, but just giving a discount out of no reason. It's like if you go to buy a car and someone goes, the sticker price is $20,000 and someone goes, oh yeah, but $10,000. Your next question is, well, I didn't even ask for it. I got it for half price. Where else can I find it cheaper? So then you're encouraging people to look elsewhere. But let's say we still went through it. So purchase options. Maybe not the most exciting way to, to get people to, to jump on. And are there actually options? Oh, it's mentioned about, um, I don't know why you can't see it. It's actually, it does have there that you can buy it in bookshops or for orders in Australia or for um, orders in the UK. So that they are there, but it's not showing on the mobile, okay. on the mobile thing. So definitely, thank you. That's a really good point. 
So this is a lovely uh, example of actually a multi a multi-channel experience where you've got a conversion which actually doesn't happen on the site. You're trying to get people to another area for them to go and actually make the purchase. So at this point in time, it would be the, and I'm not sure what the CTA is on call to action when you can actually see it, it's find a stockist near you or purchase online, delivery in three to five days. So the, which you may already have on there, but we just can't see it for some reason. And let's come down, let's go to buy it now. And I think that should just go through to the PayPal Yes, it will do. Yep. So one of the things also at this point in time, we'll be talking about how long does it take to get there as well? What happens if I don't like it? What's your return policy? Um, so we, it's a matter of lowering that anxiety. People have got to pressing that button by now. That's awesome. Thank Hopefully you so much. Helpful. Yes, definitely Welcome. worthwhile. <laughs> Great. So I think we're nearly out of time. Is that right, yeah, Jeffrey? Look, thank you, Matt. That's uh, fascinating. We do have a few minutes um, for any other questions or... Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> when you're doing A-B testing of a couple of things, you said that there's a 60% fail rate. Yes. So it is risky. How much of, like what proportion of the visitors should get the B so mm. that you reduce that risk? Yep. So just coming back to that 60%. So when I, I say 60%, that's tests that have no, that actually don't get to significance, which means that there's no real business impact, positive or negative, and then you've got a portion that's actually negative. And the reason why that's important is that you don't want your develop, development team to go and develop something which has no business impact at all. So the question is, how much traffic do I put through it and how do I split it between one variation to the next? Um, a lot of that comes down to how much traffic you've actually got available how risky the test is, and how quickly we want to get to significance on that. So um, generally, we're, we're generally pretty comfortable to do a, as much traffic as in the control is also in the variations, but you can adjust it depending on the unique experience of the test. To truly answer that question, I'd have to get into what's called statistical significance and get through that formula, which might be a little bit outside this forum. Um, but if you'd like to come see me afterwards, I'm happy to show you my the <coughs> formula behind that. Sure. Um, I do have one question. We've had over 45 people online, so that's really great. Okay. Um, uh, Alex said, how does, and this was early in the piece, 16, well, maybe 20 minutes in, how does this apply to me if I have a blog and I'm selling advertising on it? What is the first test I should run? Yeah, so on a blog, you're, you're picking up advertising based on either people looking at new pages because you're wanting to get that advertising uh, advertisement sort of impression or you're trying to get people to click through. So the purpose of a blog in that scenario may be about user engagement. How long can I keep people on the site or how can I actually get people to click through to an ad? So if, you're, if your conversion on the blog is about clicking through to an ad, generally if you bring your advertisement into the actual content of the blog. So if you look at Facebook, you can see that they're moving away from those right-hand or left-hand ads and they're putting the ads right in the middle of the content where your eyes are looking. Or even if you look at, say, news.com.au, you'll notice, notice that all the ads now are actually in the middle of the content. So if your CTA is about, or your conversion is about someone clicking on it, it's about positioning the ads within the content to make it more relevant. If it's about engagement, that's about when people get to the end of the article that they're reading, what are the other options that you would like that person to, to continue to start reading about? So if I've read something about, um, so just say your blog's about, say, fixing cars, and you get down to the bottom of it, you might talk about this is a good car for that or read the top 10 tips to this other type of automobile. So it's a matter of trying to keep people on, on the engagement side of it. And I do have another one. Julianne says, I assume that a similar set of techniques apply to service products, business, and business, as well as goods? Yeah, it all fundamentally comes from the part of what is the problem with the user? Like, why are they not converting? What's the solution that we need to do to solve it? Let's test to see whether or not that works, and if it's successful, let's implement it. So when people are looking at, say, sending through an inquiry, people have come to your website because they've got a problem. Have you solved their problem? Have you lowered their anxiety enough for them to trust that, yes, I'll give you my details. 
Now they might think that if I give you my details, you're gonna ring me up and you're gonna hit me on like call centers and you're gonna spam me and you're gonna sell my details. Maybe some messaging around that would sort of lower that anxiety. But it's a matter of like, what is actually stopping the user? Or is it the fact that you're not actually solving their problem to begin with? Maybe the content and the offering isn't relevant to the traffic that you're driving into the site. Good, well thank you. Um, I think we're just about out of time. Nothing more online? No. Okay, look, Matt, uh, thanks very much for your time. <clears throat> You've disabused me of my naive notion that there were the 10 key principles for website design. You satisfied that and that's all you needed to do. <laughs> I can see it's a lot more complicated and needs to be customised to who the client is and the product and where you are and heaps of other things. So once again, thanks very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, everybody. And thank you to the audience, both uh, people online and people who've, who've joined us here in the studio. And particular thanks to the people who very kindly organised this event today and our technical experts behind the, the camera and the boom. Uh, we do have some information about the next uh, USQ salon. Ah. Hey, here we go. Uh, right right, to the end right down the end, yeah, I must see. Hold music while we get to it. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, good, good, okay. So please put this in your diary, the 18th of July, 11 to 12 in Y103, you're online. And we'll have Joy Seitzinger talking about his lecture in blended learning from Deakin talking about leading the design of learning experiences. So once again, thanks to everyone. <laughs>